Impact Lounge is the number one YouTube channel for fans of Impact Wrestling. Make, make a, make a, uh, a good, good lucha, lucha thing. That is just a fact of life. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy BQ here. This is the Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. Filling in for Adam today. Also got Ro the Great in the place to be. And we're going to talk about Impact Wrestling's Defined show. Redefined, I should say. Uh, excuse me? Pretty good show, in my opinion. What'd you think about it, Ro? It was fine. I think the expectations I had, I felt like it didn't really meet up to what I anticipated. But overall, it was a fine show. Yeah, I think I've been seeing some seeing some mixed reviews. I don't think anyone's disliked it, but you know, I've I've seen some opinions very similar to yours. I actually really like the whole thing. There is one match I was like eh, on, but uh, the rest the rest I thought was pretty cool. So if it's your first time swinging by, hearing our voices, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Number one Impact Wrestling podcast review recap show, whatever you want to call it. And we do this each and every week. So, Ro, we're going to get right into this, and we're going to do the format a little bit different today, reviewing the show, and I think we're going to do this going forward. We're going to talk about the main event first, and then we're going to go back, go get into the rest of the show as normal. So, let's get into the trivia question thing. I know you and Adam big on that, so get into what the correct answer was from last week, and then whatever you got this week. Yeah, most certainly. Um, I actually answered this in the comment section because I was unsure if we'd have the time to discuss it today. But the correct answer by Richard Cartledge was Petey Williams as he won his first Exhibition Championship match in a gauntlet for gold. He was part of the group Team Canada that consisted of two tag champions at the time, which were Bobby Roode and Eric Young, who later went on to become TNA World Champion. And then for those of you who don't know, if you Google up Trevor Murdoch's name in Canadian Destroyer, you'll see the epic fail that uh, occurred once upon a time with him trying to do the Canadian Destroyer. So that was the correct answer. So for this week's, um, I'm just going to give two basic clues. It's a tag team who's achieved some success and impact. And the biggest clue, and this is for my sports aficionados, where they originate from about some years ago, the city, a city in this state, accomplished a big goal that ended a drought that they've had for so many years. So what team am I? Interesting, interesting. Richard Cartledge is not allowed to answer this question. I'm just kidding. It seems <laughs> like he, he gets on these so quickly. And I feel like to the audio listeners who listen on like iTunes and everything, they probably think we have like 10 listeners and, um, and he's one of them. Are you calling me a liar? I feel like his name uh, pops up every single week, so... <laughs> But Much. credit to him, though, that, you know, for a lot of people, their knowledge of, uh, you know, the old TNA, um, I'm always surprised because sometimes when I'm coming up with some of the trivia questions that I come up with, I, I like to believe a lot of the base, you know, probably started following a little bit after 09, 2010. But you got a lot of fans who followed the early days back to the, I think they were on Fox Sports once upon a time. Yeah, I'm not going to bullshit you. I, I was not watching back then. I, I have no no knowledge <laughs> that far, like at the beginning of TNA at all. I think at that point of time, I actually was not even watching wrestling period. And that's why I think I got back into it. Cause when it, TNA was started in what? 2000. Uh, I want to say 2002. 2002. I think I started getting into wrestling again, shortly after that or that ballpark. I, I don't remember, but um, I, t I took a, a break for quite some time, but yeah, uh, much love to Richard Cartledge for, uh, for the knowledge for sure. What do we got this week uh, for a question, listener question, that we can uh, talk about and discuss? Yes, yeah, so this is from Hakeem Fullerton, and he's asking, which current wrestlers on the Impact roster do we think should be in the world title picture? Uh, go ahead and give your thoughts, and then I'll share mine. Huh. Good question. Shout out to Hakeem. I like a lot of his uh, comments and, and feedback on everything. So I would say, uh, and it has nothing to do with the fact that he's in the picture right now, but if uh, I would have said Eddie Edwards, Austin Aries, Sammy Callahan, uh, I'm not going to put Brian Cage in there just yet. I would not even put Moose in there right now because he kind of only already had his shot and we're going to get into Moose and all that. But for me, it's it's a really shallow group right now. Uh, Johnny, I'm going to say Johnny Impact, even though I don't really have too much desire to see him win the title. But if you compare him and Eli Drake, 
you know, these guys last year, this time last year, they were building these two to main event bound for glory. Eli Drake is doing something with the cult of Lee. Seems like he's working his way up from the bottom. Johnny Impact, they're lobbing him softballs. They're just, hey, hey, man, we want you, we want you in the main event. We want you to be our champion, man. We're just, we're just underhanding some pitches to you, man. Just knock him out the park for us if you can. So, um, it really seems like they really want Johnny Impact to be that guy, even even though his his role is you know a little small at the moment, but it's it's pretty obvious. So uh, I'll I'll say Johnny Impact, Eli Drake, uh, Eddie Edwards, Sammy Callahan, and and uh, obviously Austin Aries, but. Off the top of my head right now, I don't really got much outside of those five. I still think the the world title scene is is pretty small. I don't even know that I would put Pentagon back in there at this point just because his title reign was so bad. But, uh, yeah, I kind of got those guys in mind at the moment. What, what about you? I have a core four similar to some of the names you mentioned. I would say Austin Aries, Eli Drake, Johnny Impact, and Moose. And then on the outside were guys that I probably have working up and down. Obviously, Brian Cage will get there eventually, but since he's occupying the X Division Championship, I wouldn't thrust him in there yet. Obviously, Sammy Callahan and Eddie Edwards. So those would probably be the three I'd have on the outside that you could have work in the main event. But my core four would be Austin Aries, Johnny Impact, Eli Drake, and Moose. How do you think an Eddie Edwards title win would get over now? Because, you know... I want to say maybe two years ago, he won the title, kind of got over like a fart in church with about half the audience, and then the audience, other half of the audience kind of enjoyed it. I, I would say now, present day, if, if he were to win it, I think it would be very well received. You know, it's not so much, I think, as far as the reception. I think it'll be received, but I just can see at this point, and nothing against him, if he wins the world title, it's probably in a sense of then trying to get the belt off of somebody to put it on someone else without having the, the title holder drop it to the person they wanted to put it to, if I'm making sense. So I see him more as like a transitional champion. All right, fair enough. That, that's kind of where I felt like he, he was a little bit before too. But So let's get into impact. We're going to get into it. Very very quickly, we're going to talk about the main event first. This is this is the meat and potatoes of the show, the really big angle, and it was the tag team match of Eddie Edwards and Moose taking on Austin Aries and Killer Cross. So on paper, really cool match. Um, I want to talk about Killer Cross first here. So, and I'm talking about Killer Cross and Aries as a team. Killer Cross, for lack of better terms, is is the bodyguard. Of Austin Aries, but what other bodyguards have we seen in the past? We 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 have Tyrus. Um, who who else who else can you think of? I mean, uh, Chris Adonis, in a, essentially kind of played that role for uh, Eli Drake. Yeah, those are two the two ones uh, that come come to mind when you think about it. But think about those characters. They're they're typically the uh, the sidekick who's who's supposed to be the big enforcer but when you put them in the ring they lose all the time or they're just an afterthought they're just standing there they're supposed to be eye candy they're supposed to be looking tough wouldn't you agree though with killer cross and austin aries if it weren't for the obvious austin aries holding the world title i feel like these two are being presented as equals yeah, but I think what makes it tough is because, you know, I've been of the mindset. I'm saying I'll let it play out. I didn't really like the pairing because I thought the role that they had Killer Cross and what they were doing was fine for him. And I just thought, you know, in a matter of time, he'd enter a big feud with someone. But I think it's just for some of us, and, you know, I can only speak for myself, obviously. But, you know, we see sometimes when people are feuding with the champion, in order to get through the, to the champion, you got to get through the muscle. So, and I think the fear with some people is, you know, if someone's trying to challenge Austin Aries, they got to obviously defeat Killer Cross. And I don't think Killer Cross at this time needs to be taking any uh, losses. So I think that's kind of like one viewpoint. But I think, like you said, if you took the title out of the equation, then yeah, they would be like on the same level. I mean, Killer Cross is actually getting mic time, which is crazy. You know, when they're backstage, you keep thinking, you know, Alicia's talking to Austin Aries. You keep thinking he's the only dude that's going to talk in this equation here. And then Cross comes in and, and he says his two cents. And he's got that big, sexy voice, man. It was uh, I was blushing listening to him cut that, cut that promo. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I really like him, man. I, I'm, I'm 
sold on Killer Cross. I absolutely love him. But yeah, I really think you take the title out of the equation. He he's being presented very you know, very much on an equal loss in Aries, very much as a main eventer. And that is the concern. Is he gonna be fed to Eddie Edwards at some point and then and then lose? You know, because that that's always been the the narrative in wrestling. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed you um you remember, I don't I don't know if you remember like the big boss man. He had to wrestle uh he had to beat the entire Heenan family to get to Mr. Perfect. Like you knew that motherfucker was going to beat all those dudes, <laughs> you, you know? And that's what, that's been the narrative for, a, for a long time. But I really feel like the way cross is being presented, is kind of like, okay, you got to get through cross, but, but I don't know that they will necessarily. Um, I, I think that adding Moose to the equation can really extend Austin Aries title reign for quite some time. So, Long story short with this match, okay, the match was it was what it was. Eddie Edwards went out there by himself backstage. Moose was taken out. There was the calling card at Killer Cross. So it was basically a two-on-one match. Moose eventually comes down. They wrestle the match. It's a non-finish because he turns on Eddie Edwards. And I thought the genius thing was Cross jumping down from the ring apron. I don't know if you saw this, you know, as it aired or or what. I wasn't able to watch it until several days later which was disappointing because I, I, it did get spoiled for me. But I really wondered, man, what if I would have seen this live? I wouldn't have seen it coming. When Cross jumped down, I would have been very convinced that it was a turn. I, I thought the whole thing was really, really well done. So what about yourself? Did you watch it as it aired, or did you kind of know what was happening already? Yeah, I watched it when it was aired, and it it was like a curveball because it let when you saw Cross jumping off the apron – it was like, oh, so Moose and Cross are in cahoots. Interesting. And then only to see him turn around and attack Eddie. Um, I'll to just be honest, and I know you were just asking about this. I didn't like the turn only because I think, you know, we always talk about, you know, this company is really hill heavy. And the one thing that Impact does well is they, and Don has mentioned this on the broadcast at times, that, you know, they believe in old school booking, like faces being cheered, hills being cheered. You know, you're looking at the main event scene as thin as it is, you know, it's really hill heavy. There's not too many baby faces. And I thought with Moose, he was that one guy, you know, everyone has different opinions of him, but I thought he was that one guy that, you know, you, he could challenge Austin Aries and, you know, as we can buy in as like triumphing and capturing the championship. It just, for me, it rubbed me kind of like, and I don't know if you for, were for, um, familiar with it, but with Monty Brown, when he was uh, gaining all this momentum and he would come up short against Jarrett only later on to join up with Jarrett. It was just it, it screamed uh, Planet Jared to me, right? And I, I hope I really hope that's not where it's going. But the two things I want to say is that um, first, uh, regarding the turn, you know, heel turns, baby faces, baby face turns, they're always so telegraphed. I mean, let's go back to Eddie Edwards and and uh, Davy Richards. This is the first one I can think of because it's fairly recent. Stevie Wonder could have seen that through a brick wall. From a mile away. We could see that a mile away that Davey was going to turn on Eddie Edwards. This happened out of nowhere. And there's, you know, sometimes the fans, and, you know, we do it too sometimes, want to put those Booker hats on and be like, what? They're, they're sitting here trying to rack their brain. Like, why Why would Moose do this? That makes no sense. And, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to put themselves in the mindset of creative. I say let's enjoy it. It's something that came out of nowhere. Didn't see it coming. Let's allow Impact Wrestling a chance to tell a story and tell us why Moose did the turn. If it's something dumb like, oh, when I was in the hospital, Eddie Edwards, he didn't call. Don't pull that shit again. It will get over like a fart in church. Do not pull that shit again. But if they can come up with something creative as to as to why it happened, I love the inclusion of uh, Alicia out there came with the slap and everything at the end. And Moose almost looked like he was going to hit her. Like Alicia's really good at what she does. I'd like to see her pick up some wins in the ring, but as far as her role and in all this, I think she does a really good job. But the second thing I want to say too, is that um, this was something I had discussed on previous podcasts and everything is that Moose after bound for glory, we we discussed this like where where what are they gonna do with him now? Because I thought the build for Bound for Glory for the two of them was really good, but now that he lost, you, he can't go back to the Moose chant and the the NFL shit the the same story we've been getting for two years. Like you can't do that. You there has to be a new layer in Moose after Bound for Glory. 
And they've been doing a good oh, job with Slam. that. I'm, I'm sorry, you talking about Slammiversary, Slammiversary, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, after, after Slammiversary. But, you know, they did that with a good job with Matt Seidel. He had two cracks at Brian Cage, couldn't beat him. So now they're, um, you know, because in other mainstream wrestling companies, they just keep putting the guys against each other, against each other, because they have no clue how to write the story off. They don't know how to end the feud. They have no clue. So here what Impact is doing is, okay, Seidel lost. We, now we have to... We have to change his mindset on on TV. We're we're watching him change his way of thinking. You know, he's going from this to this, and I I really feel like Moose could not have gone just gone back to the Moose chant and the when I was in the NFL I did it. No, we need something new. I mean, but wouldn't you agree? Like that, this was most most turns are, are are so telegraphed. I mean, this was just something. Yeah, it's exciting to me. Well, the one thing and the on a positive note, what I looked at, I said if they really wanted to make this. And I'm not saying that it's wrong, but really make this look good because obviously this is a stable. You know, you got Austin Aries, a smaller guy who's champion, and he hires these two, uh, you know, muscle muscle bound guys. Really, would it be nice if you had them challenging the, in the tag division? Could you imagine where you got Austin Aries world champion, and if you have the tag team of Moose and Killer Cross as tag team champions, that's a that's a that might be one of the most dominant stables that the company's had in quite some time. That would be amazing, and. As fans, again, I'm going back to, you know, putting my fan hat on. We're always a fantasy book in stables. We want these, you know, these factions, these stables. But you're more likely to get Eli Drake and the Cult of Lee as a stable than you are another, you know, another shield. Because yeah. there there was a point, you know, not the current incarnation bullshit of them. But the initial version of, like, the shield was they were all on equal footing. But normally in wrestling when we get a stable... You know, uh, you, you get the the main person, and then you get the two buffoons that can't beat anybody. And it's it's I use the Eli Drake and Cult of Lee as an example because I don't really know what they're doing there, but you're more likely to get that in a stable in today's wrestling world. They just for some reason they don't want to put them on equal playing fields. But I feel like this this is like as close to that as we've seen in, in quite some time. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. But like I said, I think we're both in agreement. We're just hoping it's not no scenario where it's like, you know, you got to go through these two just to get to Austin Aries. We want to see both these guys serve, having them serve a purpose, not just be somebody to lay on the mat. My concern, though, is if they were to win a tag titles, which would be, it would be cool, what are they going to do? Because then, then you got to put them in multiple storylines or they're just going to walk around holding the tag titles while not defending them. I, I don't know if we're going to see that scenario. Uh, it would be pretty be pretty cool, but maybe they do. Maybe they take them from LAX because LAX at some point is going to lose to the OGs. I don't think they want to put the titles on the OGs. Like the OGs are wrestling squash matches, and I think it's because the crowd does not want to see them wrestle that long. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would go very flat if they had longer matches. So let's get into the rest of the show. Again, I was someone who was a big fan of of Redefine. The opener was the X Division title match between Brian Cage and Phoenix. I watched this match a couple times. I loved it from top to bottom. My my concern is that the really good matches that Impact are putting out, it's always Phoenix, Cage, Pentagon, Sammy. Like it's the same core dudes. And we just talked about who do we want to see in the world title picture. Well, the only person that I just listed there was Sammy. So I, I have some concerns that some of these guys uh, basically, it came from Lucha Underground. Ha- are putting on the best matches, and uh, I like to see some some of the other guys really get in the mix here. But this opening X Division match, I thought was phenomenal. It was a long match, almost 17 minutes long, and I was just into it from top to bottom. What do you got on this one? Yeah, this was obviously the match of the night. It's crazy to think that this opened the show. I mean, this could you could argue this could easily main event it, or at least you know the match before the main event. Um, yeah, I share your, the same sentiments. I mean, Brian Cage, man, for anyone who plays the wrestling games, straight out busted out the create a wrestler move set. I mean, what move didn't he do? He done. He did. We seen him do X Vision stuff, powerhouse stuff. I mean, you know, it was phenomenal. You know, the one thing, and I don't even want to say it was a criticism, but I was surprised. I didn't. I, I was surprised that they didn't let Phoenix get a little more offense in. And what I mean by that, it seemed like outside of the cutter. We've just seen him do a lot of strikes. And we've seen in Brian Cage's matches, and when you think about a couple weeks ago with uh, against, um, excuse me, uh, Seidel, 
you know, we saw Seidel able to lift Brian Cage off his feet a couple of times in the match. So I was surprised that they didn't give Phoenix that same opportunity. I was really looking for that because you could only kick somebody so many times. But with that said, man, this, you know, this, 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 I guess you could say, argue for me, this is what peaked the show. And I do share the same concerns that you do as far as like a lot of these matches that we're finding ourselves being enamored by. It's always consisting of Callahan, who who at least signed with us, and then the Lucha Underground guys. And I guess the biggest concern is, you know, if we were to ever lose those guys, who's going to fill that void? Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And Pentagon said recently that WWE has not been in contact with them, but there's the rumors that they have been and that they're canceling bookings. And if we were to learn, lose those two guys, they, they would be hard shoes to fill. Maybe not from a, uh, you know, a standpoint of creative and cutting promos and all that, but I mean, I'm just talking about the in-ring product but it's definitely um you know that that same that same core of guys. I like to see here one one week and say, man, this match that Austin Aries did, that Eli Drake did, that he's, that Eddie Edwards did. Like I want to talk about that, talk about like talk like that about those guys too. After this match, they were, and I was con- not concerned. I was confused why Pentagon came out with them, and now you see the end of the match makes a lot of sense. Ove and Sammy Callahan come down. And uh, and to our argument, you know, uh, OVE has been part of some really good matches too, and they're they're impact guys, so that's good. But and I'm talking about Dake and Jave Chris, not necessarily Sammy. Uh, they came down, very random beat down. I recorded this Brian Cage vlog, and I actually have to redo it now because I didn't I didn't upload it yet. But at the end, you know, spoiler alert if you listen to my vlogs. At the end, I talk about who I think is going to take the title off Brian Cage, and I'd actually said it was Sammy Callahan. I think he's going to be the next X Division champion. they got to put a belt on Sammy at some point. I don't think they're going to put the world title on him yet because Austin's still doing really good work. So that's really where I think they're going with it, and and, uh, I had been thinking this for several weeks, actually, just out of straight trying to use common sense. And now that that feud is over. So at first it was like, okay, what's this random beatdown? No, that that feud is over. What is doing and Impact has been doing this with the new management is finding a what creative ways to just get to to transition into new feuds. So do you think that's where they're going with it? That uh, Sammy and Cage are now we're going to get into something. Yeah, I believe so. I, I mean, I think what's going to happen is Cage is going to align with the Lucha Brothers to help fend off OVE. I do think if that occurs, Cage is going to lose the title, but. I think the way they take the belt off a of cage whenever they decide, it's going to be some type of multi-man match. I really think they want to save his actual first pinfall or submission loss for something special, like at a big you know, pay-per-view or whatever the case may be. So I think, you know, if you get the, if the, when they do take the belt off of him, and if it is Sammy who takes it, it's going to be in some type of multi-man match where maybe he goes over the top rope. And, that, and some people might not be a fan of that, but I'm just not sold on them wanting him to eat up a uh, pinfall loss this early. I, I could see them somehow doing a uh, Brian Cage versus all three OVE members match. I, I mean, okay. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but at the same time, I can I can see it going going somewhere like that. But I think I, I've made my predictions before. I actually think Brian Cage is going to be in the world title main event for Bound for Glory. That's just my gut. I think, I think he's going to lose the title before then. But to your point, Brian Cage should lose it on a, on a live live event because uh, when I say live, I mean a live episode of Impact, which doesn't seem like we're getting this year, or a pay-per-view. Because, I mean, go back to EC3 losing. EC3 had that win streak for how long, and then he loses on a taped episode of Impact. That That's how you're doing it? That, that's where we're going with this now? He And now, wait, his first loss, that was the one to Bennett, right? Yeah. Okay, I remember. I think, though, with his, and we see some of these undefeated streaks that people have, you can have one where it's been like, and you know, we, we look back at, like, Goldberg's, where when he finally lost, it was a big deal. Then some of these where maybe they're not wrestling, for, you know, they're only wrestling so many matches, and it's just through the year, you know, time has progressed where they've been undefeated. I think when EC3's case, you know, it, it ran, it kind of took its course. So I think they probably felt like, ah, whether he loses on pay-per-view or on, on TV, it's no big deal. But I get the big picture what you're saying is when you build a guy up and they have this streak, when they do lose, you want to make it count. Or, or female, too. You know, you want to make it count. 
And when you just have it on some throwaway show, it just diminishes what, you know, all that work that you put in building up the character. So I think we're very obviously going to be getting Brian Cage and the Lucha Brothers against the OVE team, which that's going to be a phenomenal match. That's one we're going to sit here and be like, dude, this was just insane. But again, now we're talking about the same, same six people, you know, same core people putting on these, these really, really good matches. And, you know, how much are we going to put the Lucha Brothers with a partner against OBE? You know, that that just, after that, I think that's where they're going with that. But after that, they need to put Pentagon and Phoenix somewhere else, which my gut, I, I talked about my Bound for Glory predict, predict, predictions. I think the Lucha Brothers are going to take on LAX of the pay-per-view personally. Um, but then they got to find OBE and all them something else to do, man. Uh, instead of messing with these dudes all the time. So I think it is going to be uh, Sammy and Cage going forward. So Eli Drake had a segment. Again, as I said earlier, in comparison to Johnny Impact, they're you know they're throwing Eli Drake fastballs and they're lobbing softballs to, to Johnny Impact. Uh, Eli Drake calls out Brandon Tidwell and uh, Mr. Atlantis, who looked about to be 45 years old, uh, called them down. And uh, it's basically an open challenge. I think he has an open challenge this week coming up too, doesn't he? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so basically the open challenge. Uh, Mr. Atlantis accepted and said he rested <laughs> Brandon Tidwell and beat him <laughs> pretty convincingly, pretty quickly. And uh, I, as, as quick as this was, and even though it was a squash, I really enjoyed Eli Drake in this. I'm... I have no clue, and that's a good thing. You know, we talk about wrestling being predictable all the time. I have no clue what they're doing with this Eli Drake and, and Cult of Lee thing. They have done some funny stuff backstage, and I, I've I've got a kick out of it, but I just don't get what the big picture is with it, which which is fine. I'm willing to learn along the way, but w- what are your thoughts, you know, on this, what they're doing with him right now, Eli Drake? Well, I mean, I think even you can lump in uh, the Cult of Lee. I just think it's... You know, for both, you know, bo- both the team and Eli Drake, they could be utilized better. I mean, Colt of Lee, I mean, why aren't they, you know, still in contention challenging LAX for the tag titles? I know we got some of that a couple months ago, but, you know, you could use them again. And then Eli Drake, it's, you know, as happy, you know, me being a big fan of his and him being my favorite wrestler on the roster you know, I was happy once he resigned. I really thought, okay, they're gonna have some sort of direction with him. Then we see him working with Joe Hendry, and not that that's a knock with Joe Hendry, but Ho- Joe Hendry, you know, new star on the rise. Um, you know, I just kind of thought with Eli Drake, you know, the main event picture is where he needs to be, but there's really no pathway for him to, right now. So, you know, it, you know, we just got to see what happens. I mean, I'm, I know they have some type of long-term plan but you know like I said I just think this was a time that if you had a mid-card belt you know this would help somebody like him just for the time being somebody that doesn't really have no clear-cut direction so I really think the Scarlet Bordeaux stuff um, transitioning on is really hit or miss I I like the smoke show thing Um, I, I liked her interview with Alicia I thought her the following week interview with Bobo was a complete train wreck uh, so some of this backstage stuff, I like her in that role. I understand what Adam says when it's like, she's trying to be sexy, but she's not, but, she, but she is, <laughs> but when she was doing the in-ring, not the in-ring, but the, uh, in arena interviews, she reminded me of like someone's wife who's trying to spice things up in the bedroom. So they, you know, put on a dress and start dancing, but they can't really dance type of thing. Like. It's been a little difficult for me to watch in some cases, but then there's some things where she just nails it. Uh, so what she did, you know, last week with Great Own everything, and and this week like she nails that stuff. I thought this security guard segment though was really hard to watch. I don't know if, I mean, do you think that some of this like super corny acting is on purpose? Perhaps. I mean, I I just been of the mindset, and now that you just pointed it out, it's really been night and day when you think about when they were having the interviews in the impact zone, and then once they transitioned to, and I know the smoke shows started from you know the backstage backstage segments, tape segments, like it's it's you know I I really I always thought it would be better received in the impact zone, but it seems like now. Um, that yeah, they're going. It's intentionally made to be corny. 
Yeah, it, it was. It's it's hard for me because sometimes you got guys who are just, you know, Hendry and all them. Like the the acting is really good, and then you bring in like these extras, like the security dude. Like, get out of here. Um, <laughs> that guy was so bad. This Bobo guy's awful. But I I think they're fine. There there's a a humorous side of it that makes it kind of entertaining, but. I just thought that interview that he conducted was was one of the worst things I had seen since the uh, b- race for the case reveal uh, <laughs> a few years ago, which still gives me nightmares. Um, so after that, we get our, our favorite part of the show, the uh, GWN flashback. Did you see that uh, Adam was – I don't know if you saw on Twitter. I tweeted the picture out because he sent it to me, but – there's a point on TV where someone's holding up a sign about Grado. And I remember trying to read the sign. I didn't realize Adam was standing or sitting right next to him. And Yeah, he sent me the picture too. Yeah, I think it's so funny. We're sitting here every week saying this fucking GWN flashback. You know, we complain about it weekly. And there's a picture of him yelling with his finger up. And then there's the GWN logo next to him. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, my gosh. Um. So this match was Drew Galloway. We'll get into it real quick versus I mean it wasn't Drew Galloway, I'm sorry. It was Al Snow versus Grado. It was this was Grado's debut match, right? Was this the first match he had on TV? Yes. Okay, so uh he actually kind of wrestled. Al Snow was like in really good shape. I had no point to I had no chance excuse me. I had no choice but to watch this because I was watching on my phone, uh streaming it, so I couldn't really fast forward. So I watched it uh the match was okay, and um, this is where Drew Galloway debuts. Now, this is disguised as, okay, we're going to put a great – We always you, you say this all the time. You use people who are currently in the company, whatever. This was disguised as uh, Grado. You know, let's let's go back to Grado's first. This was to fucking put Drew Galloway and Samoa Joe on TV, like especially Drew Galloway. We know, we know the games that they do, you know, <laughs> and it actually – I understand why they do it. it it's just, it, it, it's just funny. But you got anything on this throwback match at all? I just, you know, I, you know, I welcome the fact that they use someone like Grado. I thought that was cool. But they're just so inconsistent with these things because one week they'll show us like maybe like a four minute, four minute clips of a match, and then that's it. And then, then the following week we get the long extended, you know, match. So and then, yeah, once again showing people who aren't here. Um, and it just, the thing that I hate with it, and I don't know if it's just coincidental or they do it intentionally, but it always seems, cause I had read in the news that I guess he might be working a program with uh, Roman Reigns exactly. and, and then surprisingly, you know, the GWN flashback, it's his debut in impact or TNA at that time. <laughs> exactly. I read the same thing. Uh, I read the same article. I saw it online saying he's rumored to be the next opponent. And I read that like a day or so before this episode and boom, here's, here's Galloway on TV. So you know, I, I always talk about I'm in the marketing world. That's what I've studied for years. What they're doing is is textbook. It, it really is. You know, if someone's in the news, find a way to I, shit. I do it on the channel. I, I did a Tessa Blanchard upload today because all in just happened. Like, I get it. I do the same stuff. But they just have this history of trying to capitalize off the WWE. And that's my problem. It's like I get what you're doing and it's it is good marketing. But at the same time. You've got this history. You've got this negative image, TNA stank that you have to shed. So at least give us a, a month <laughs> where you're just not not relying on the stings and the AJs and the Joes. J- just one month. Give it. Give us some time. Give us some breathing space, and then go back to your obvious trying to you know play into what WWE is doing. And and that that's what it was. They you know found a way to get Drew Galloway on TV. We're talking about that. Way too long. I, I could write a book about the uh, GWN. Um, let's move on, though. Uh, I'm not going to get into some of these. Oh, yeah. So there was a, a LAX celebration backstage and everything. So I had just... I had not seen the episode as it aired as a, as a week... as a ma- Ugh, Jesus. I had not seen the episode as it aired. As a matter of fact, I saw it about a week later where he hit the kid with the car. Um, so I finally saw it a couple days ago. I, I, I don't know the uproar. I thought it was so poorly done, to be honest, that, uh, you know, it wasn't like the, the segment didn't get any kind of emotion out of me. And as far as them hitting a kid, I'm watching a TV show. 
it, it doesn't bother me at all. And I am a father, but I am watching a TV show. The kid didn't have blood. He didn't, you know what I'm saying? Like there was, but I th actually thought that was actually very poorly done, but I liked the idea of it to, to find a way to keep this feud going. So I, for one, what about yourself? I'm, I'm happy to see them find a way to keep the OGs around because I really thought when they lost that street fight, they were, they were done. You know, as far as a kid, even when I initially watched it, I didn't think of uh, imminent death. I thought he just got sideswiped and he got hit. And, you know, yeah, it was poorly done. But, you know, what do you expect, give or take the kids, what, nine, ten years old? You know, and being told, hey, to do this and they're going to, you know, act like they're going to hit you. I'm sure he was giggling because he's probably thinking, man, well, when I tell everyone at school I'm going to be on TV, you know, I'm going to be Mr. Popular. So, um, but well, real quick, I, I don't mean like his part was poorly done. I meant like the way that, you know, the, the, the car didn't screech or anything. They all moved out of the way and all of a sudden he hits the kid and they're still standing there for like a couple seconds, like frozen. And then they're like, Richie, like they, I didn't get anything from the LA side that they were beside themselves. You know, they yeah. did. So that's, that's what I mean. Yeah, no, no, altogether too. I'm just saying because to me where where it's, you know, suspended my belief is just kinda like normally when, you know, if a car is running at full speed, you're moving everyone. They don't the kids are the first ones that are pushed out of the way. You know, it's not the adults. They, you know, cared for Conan more than they did for the kids. So but you know what? It was kind of one of those things that I think we all know, you know, you and I know and some of fans know with impact, you know, they're they're held for some reason to a higher standard than other companies, even though they get the most flack for things that they do. So anything that we might perceive to be minuscule, anyone will find anything. And you look at the climate we live in, we, it's an outrage culture. They find anything to complain about. So, I mean, it is, it is what it is, but yeah, as far as the feud between them and the OGs, it's good that they're getting mileage out of it. But once again, you know, how many times are the OGs going to lose until it's time for LX to just move on? You know, so you kind of, it makes you wonder eventually, are they going to get some type of win in to kind of continue this? Or is it just going to be a flat out just shutout where LX is just owning them week in and week out? Right. And that's why I've said, or we, we've said, even everyone said, they, this, this feud doesn't need the titles. It never needed them because then it pigeonholes you in how you, how you're going to, you know, book it going forward. And I think you're right. The OGs might might get a donut out of this one. They might they might go to, go over three on this. I don't know. I'm glad they're on. I just I have a hard time seeing how they can utilize the OGs going forward after this. I, I but they're also on one of the Bound for Glory posters. So hell if I know. But I hope they find a way. King has has proven himself this time around to be an asset. You know it would it would not make sense to me for them to just. Uh, let him go. So both of them, there's two segments here. We're just going to talk about them briefly. There's two segments. They both receive phone calls, Conan and King, and both say along the same lines, don't do anything till I say so, whatever it is. We know that Diamante has been saying on social media, you'll see what, what side I'm involved in. So maybe she comes in. Maybe there's another female. We've been fantasy booking Ivalice for a little while. But I don't know if the female's phone call is the one that they're acting like. Oh, okay, all right, don't do anything. I mean, it sounds like they're receiving a phone call from much higher up. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I feel like the person that they're receiving the call from is going to be the same person. So maybe that's somebody that's working with both of them. Yeah, it's got to be something like that. But we can't bring in too many people because we they still we still got to you know. Obviously, Diamante is going to have some kind of involvement, but then we can't just keep throwing people in, especially non-wrestling characters. So, yeah. So the knockouts title match was Sue Young defending against Ali and Tessa Blanchard. Before we talk about the match, what were your thoughts on Sue Young's title reign? Mismanaged. I mean, it's something that's happened time and time again we've seen it throughout impact at times where the champion takes a back seat for another angle so you know i think when she initially won the title you know it was nice it was a uh, welcoming fresh surprise i knew you know when word got out that they were talking about having her feud with rosemary 
you know, like we just you just mentioned, some of these feuds don't need the title involved. So it's like if you're giving her a title reign just to have her as champion, then that's fine. But to have her hold it until Rosemary comes back is probably not the best idea. But yeah, I just feel like it was just mismanaged. I mean, we've seen her kind of really. She only feuded with Allie. That's it. We never really got to an opportunity to see her interact with anyone else. I never bought into the Madison Rain thing, and they said said the whole point of that was to give her give Sue Young a strong win in her first title defense. Really, did it help her in the long run? <laughs> no, I mean, and I thought at the end of the day that that was booked very well, creatively. But yeah, if if you just end up dropping it in a triple threat where you don't even get pinned right after that. Um, a character like hers loses a little bit of mystique the more people you put in the ring with her. Um, you know, she 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 does best in one on one matches, or if she tags with the undead bridesmaid. Casey Spinelli has a great picture on Twitter, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I don't know if you've seen it. She was at a wedding. She was a uh, a plus one for someone at a wedding, and she's holding up a little sign that says "Always a bridesmaid, never a bride." <laughs> I'm about to look right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great picture. Uh, she probably put it up a couple weeks ago. Uh, great picture, though. But um, I was talking to someone uh, work, that works with Impact because I was I was confused. I was like, you know, Rebel keeps showing up on TV, but every time they update the roster, she's not she's not there. <laughs> you know, she's not on the uh, roster page, and kind of start talking about her. Um, Casey Spinelli and so I guess there's three tiers of contracts there's the the people who are there on salary um there's still a few of those that do exist Eli Drake Ali basically the people you see on the, the people you see on most of the twitch shows most of the one night only's like there's that consistent core like usually that's the salary guys and they're always the priority to be booked um and, and that's what a, a wrestler told me as far as that goes. And then there's the, the per night guys or the yeah, per basis guys that, you know, they're on the, they're on the website, you know, say they're, they're on the roster, but they're really getting paid every time they show up. And then you got a third tier, which are, they're also paid uh, per appearance, but just when they're needed. So that's where KC and, and rebel come in. And um, you know, a couple others like, Hey, we're just going to call you if we need you. They're reliable. We're not really making an official member, but we're going to pay you, you know, so th that's kind of where those girls stand. But, uh, yeah, dude, I actually, I actually kind of, I really like Sue Young as the champion, you know, maybe with her, her character, they could have gone longer without giving her the title. Cause I don't know where the hell they go with her next. Like a character like that, you've got, you can't just throw her in, throw her in matches. So I, I have no clue. They, they really got to, uh, make the knockout they, they gotta add a few more knockouts and we, we talk about this a lot but they really do but uh yeah they uh -huh. oh go ahead i'm sorry no, no 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 all i was gonna add was it was just you know once again they should have had a feud with more people because even now when you think about this match and i'll, I'll give my thoughts after you give yours one would assume it's gonna be ali challenging uh tessa so it's Ali staying in the picture. I think with Sue Young and with, with and not just Sue Young, a lot of these people who are champions sometimes, you know, having them feud with multiple people helps helps them in the long term. You know, you have them just feud with one person and and then going back to the same person, it you know does them a disservice. So it's going to be interesting to see how they use her because the one concern that I have and I always have with people once they lose the title and, and especially the Knockouts Championship and Sienna comes to mind. We've seen once Sienna lost the Knockouts Championship for the second time, she just kind of, you know, fell in the background. And I worry if that will happen to Sue Young because I don't know if you had saw it too, but there were some people that were critical of her ring work. And I've always just been on the mindset, look, as long as you can, or you're competent in the ring, that's fine. I'm not one of these all five-star match type guys. Like, as long as you can go and it's passable, I'm good with that. And I felt maybe some of that criticism of her ring work might have, uh, um, you know, doomed her a little bit. But that's the thing that I fear. Like, now that she's not champion, how can they keep her relevant? Well, regarding her ring work, I mean, look at her character. What What kind of moves do they want her doing? I mean they have to sell her as some deranged woman, but you, you also don't want to make it clear that person went to wrestling school. You know, um, 
it, it's kind of like a. This is super random. I, just because someone brought up his name the other day, um, there's a dude in the WWF a long time ago, Nails, that he was, yeah, that wrestled like the boss man. Um, I don't know if I saw. I must have came across a picture of him on social media or something, but that dude, I mean, he, he came, he came in his jumpsuit, you know, straight out of, straight out of jail. He, his moveset's going to be so limited because of his character. You know, they, they can't present this dude that just got out of jail. But he also went to wrestling school. It makes, that makes no sense. So, uh, with a character like Sue Young, you, you know, you, you have to make her, 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 her ring work has to match the character. Um, but yeah, the knockouts division in general is just, it's very rushed, you know, and we've talked about this ad nauseum with uh, LAX that, you know, the tag team division also is always very rushed. Those two divisions are really rushed to the point. It's like, I mean, Z and E top dropped the titles. What the hell are they doing now? You know, it's exactly what you're saying. You brought up Sienna, happened with Jade, um, having a lot of past champions at those two divisions. If you look at the X division, like Brian Cage, like, even uh, Matt Seidel, like they were focused on one dude at a time. So Brian Cage runs through uh, Matt Seidel. He runs through, um, who did he just beat? Uh, Phoenix. And then from there, it's like, okay, if you want to give him DJ Z, if you want to give him Andrew Everett, if you want to give him, uh, uh, who, who else am I thinking of? Either the Cult of Lee guys, you can give him Desmond Xavier. You know what I'm saying? Like you can give him this whole list of dudes. There's still a whole roster because he's not doing th- – this was a problem, you know, obviously the X Division had in the past where doing all these multi-man matches. Like, if, if you just one by one work with people, then your list of opponents is substantially larger. But if you keep doing uh, multi-man matches, multi-woman matches, and then you're crossing storylines over, like, you're going to run out of opponents very quickly. That's just, just the way it is. What do you think of the match, though? I thought it was fine. Um, I want to say I wish I was as excited as I thought I would have been when I initially seen this advertised. I just felt like the win, and you know, I'm happy to have Tessa being Knockouts champion because I think you know we're gonna see her on TV every week. You know, she's gonna be cutting promos. You know, the title's gonna be defended like all that we want in our champion. But I don't know. I think just the ending, how it came across. And then it had me wondering, too. I'm like, do they fully intend to put the belt on her? Or were they doing this just because since she's competing at uh, where she had competed at All In, did they want her walking in as champion? So uh, and and I don't know. It just didn't seem as a a big deal. And I, I always had envisioned Tessa's first knockouts championship win to be a big deal. And it just didn't strike me as that. And then, you know, it looks like now we're gonna see her assuming that they do a rematch clause after the rematch clause between her and Sue Young, we're going to see her feud with Allie again. And it just looks like that's probably the story they're going to want to tell is, you know, the feud that Allie and Tessa have been having, you know, it's going to eventually culminate at Bound for Glory, perhaps. I think the match was done to try to keep Allie looking strong, try to keep Sue Young looking strong. Like when you, uh, when you, the use of a roll up when done properly just makes it look like a fluke. And that's basically what they try to do with uh rich Swan. We'll talk about him a little bit later, you know, Matt moves that just out of nowhere, get a pin or roll up. It, it, it's done. Uh, so it's a, so it's a bit fluky and everyone still looks strong. They are doing the rematch next week of, uh, Sue young versus Tessa. The graphic is horrible. Like, man, I, I'm one of the first people back, like, man, the graphics they do are, are freaking amazing. This one is terrible. Um, the reason I say that it's the same picture as we always see of the girls, but uh, Tessa's picture is so much larger than Sue Young's, and the one Sue Young picture they use, it looks like her head is really, really big, and she has a little <laughs> tiny body. <laughs> uh, I have to look, look at it again. <laughs> yeah, like if you look at the graphic of that match or, or this triple threat match, it's it's I, I I keep looking at the picture trying to like figure out why it looks like that. Uh, but that that's what it looks like. It's really weird. Um, but yeah, I, I actually think they're going to find a, a new opponent for Tessa somehow. Uh, but she's, again, run through a couple of the other girls. You know, if they would have just kept her and Allie working together, they could have, you know, found something else for Sue to do. But I did a vlog today. 
on the channel about who I think her opponent is going to be a bound for glory. So, so definitely uh, check that one out and uh, you can, you can find out who I think Tessa is going to work with next. And also who I think will beat Tessa for the title ultimately. So we get something backstage with Gama Singh and a Desi hit squad. I really, I really like what they're doing with, with Gama Singh, like hitting them and slapping them and beating them for losing, even for winning that I like. And I, I really wish before they wrestled and before he Hakeem Zayn even became uh, became Rohit Raju. Like I wish we got a bunch of vignettes of this for a while. I think that would have been an excellent way to build it up. Um, so when I when I I have to interview him here soon, uh, not have to. I sound like make it sound like it's a chore. Uh, but he's going to be coming on, and I'm curious to hear his thoughts. But I know Adam has said that he thinks Gama Singh is the problem. Because it seems like when the Desi Hit Squad's actually wrestling, they're they're missing something. Uh, me personally, I think they're involved with too much comedy. I, I think that's what what hurts them a little bit. But uh, what do you think about these backstage segments? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I my opinion on them, I was high on them and I liked what they were doing. But it makes me wonder if they're dead on arrival because I the thing that. And I guess I'm in disagreement with you as far as when they would win and we see see uh, Gama Singh berate them. You know, the whole point of the team is for them to generate heat and be a hill team. I think people can sympathize with, you know, you're working hard and then, you know, you don't get no credit and then you're just being berated. So I kind of thought that that approach wasn't the best, but. I don't know where they they're going with him, and I know it's still early. You know, I just I guess I just look at it from the standpoint. You look at the tag division. You look at some of these different divisions where they can use you know some fresh challengers, and we see the talents there, but it's just putting them in in the place for them to be successful. So I really thought they were on the road to you know potentially challenge LAX. So we just have to see what's next for them. I really think they are trying to put the titles on them sooner than later. And they're not in a place to, to win those right now uh, on television. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I could see them getting them in a fluky win in order to get the, the belts off LAX and continue that OGs feud so the OGs can win because I don't think they want to put the belts on the OGs. The smoke show with uh, Scarlett Bordeaux, you know, I know you like them in, in the arena. I, I, I kind of like the talk show segment. It's not even a talk show, but it kind of is uh, backstage. I, I, I think that's different. So she has Henry Grado and Katarina. And, th and these segments are very quick, but I, I thought it was pretty well done. And I actually was really laughing when Grado had the water bottle. <laughs> the water was shooting out of it. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I think, you know, and I grasped it a little bit, he, but I he, think I know what you're He had to. a bottle between his legs, and she was whispering to him, and he was. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> But there, uh, I know, I know your thoughts. We talk about this all the time. But um, I actually like Joe Hendry so much, and I like Katarina. I actually like Grado too. Like, I, I'm cool with their segments. So next week is going to be the two of them against the Desi Hit Squad, aforementioned. So we'll see what happens with that. Hopefully, we get a uh, uh, the next wrinkle in this story because this uh, the build has been about as slow as as Ali's build from two years ago. Rich Swan versus PD Williams. I'm curious if you enjoy this. Like, I was actually not really entertained with this, uh, and I like Rich Swan a lot, you know. And I brought up Cage as a whole list of opponents. I didn't even bring up Rich Swan and PD Williams. I mean, and it, it seems like after from the the segment afterwards that Rich Swan probably sooner than later is going to be in that title picture. Um. But I don't know, in comparison to the opening match between Cage and Phoenix, like I found this kind of boring, to be totally honest with you. It, it just didn't do anything for me. Uh, I will say I like the finish. We don't see a lot of that, enough of that in wrestling where, you know, it just out of nowhere, he just he just gets the pin, you know? Like, I thought that was actually kind of cool. But the match didn't do much for me. Um, Swan needed this win, obviously. And they're going to have a rematch next week where Petey Williams is saying it was a fluke. You know, I, I personally think they are going to use this match as an opportunity or they're working towards writing Petey Williams off TV as a competitor. 
that's where I think, because now he's doing backstage uh, agent and creative and everything. I think they're looking for a way to, to write him off TV. It could be, you know, if I can't beat Swan, then, I'm, then I quit. You know, I don't know, but what, what do you got on this uh, X Division match? At first, I had thought the finish. I thought it was a botch at first because I was like, didn't he count two? And then when I seen it was a three, I was like, whoa, you know? So um, I just think, you know, it was the placement. I think if you would have had this be the opening match and had the Cage Phoenix match be in this place, everything would have went fine. Um, it was fine. I, the match was fine. I mean, there was really nothing I had too much of a problem with. Um, it gave Swan a win, and I like you believe in, in a matter of time, he will be challenging for the X division title. Cause not that I mean, you know, like to pigeonhole people, but his style just from the matches that I've seen, it's tailor made X division. It screams X division. So, you know, he's going to be one of the staples in the division in years to come. But, you know, as far as the re, uh, rematch, I don't get, uh, see that PD Williams is they're going to write him off. I think they're still going to use him as a hand in the X division as that uh, vet. So um, in, in that part, I mean, I think, I mean, who knows? Maybe PD Williams gets his win back because we've seen after this, we've seen the Seidel um, trying to give Swan some advice and Swan wasn't really ex receptive to it. So maybe we see, dare I say, Seidel interfere with, in Swan's match and then we get a program with Seidel and uh, Swan, that'd be interesting. And why is it, let me ask you, why is it, it seems like with the X division, and I guess you could say the world title picture in some aspect, but they're able to have feuds that don't require involving the title. It seems like these are the only two divisions. Right, which is crazy because a, a year ago, the X division didn't have storylines at all. And now we're getting yeah. we're getting actual feuds actual storylines and, and yeah i think you're right they're obviously working uh, uh an angle with uh rich swan and matt Seidel going forward i love this matt Seidel where he just came up and tried to give him advice and i just think they did when matt Seidel lost those matches the cage and then the match the pentagon when they had this segment where he was like kind of doing yoga and meditating outdoors and he you know the images of cage and pentagon were coming in he was kind of struggling with him and then trying to find peace like that was so well done, in my opinion, and I think they're just doing a phenomenal job with Matt Seidel. And I recorded this upload for the channel, man. I never uploaded it. I don't remember why. I think I just kept messing up the uh, audio, and I just I finally gave up. But I did seven wrestlers who needed new gimmicks um, with Impact, or or in 2018 needed some kind of change. You know, something, some go a different direction. And it's crazy, I, you know, aside from Alberto El Patron being one of them, um, six of the nine, uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> have all done exactly what I said in the video, um, almost almost to a T of how I said, you know, to uh, to change their characters. I mean, if talking about Eddie, Seidel, a couple other guys, I mean, I mean, almost to a T, like the ideas that I had. So I, now I kind of wish I uploaded that because I, I would have sounded like a, a freaking prophet, but... Um, I like what they're doing with Seidel. Yeah, and I think that's where they're going with it. We already talked about the main event. So, you got anything else on this uh, this episode? I, I thought it was good. The um, ratings were low again. Um, let's talk about ratings for a second. <coughs> Excuse me. So, they're, they're low once again. Uh, in the bottom, two, I think 220 or, or, or something like that. And there's, there's people on social media who are finding a positive and saying, well, it's going up. Um, it's down like 80,000 from where it was last year or, or even several months ago. NFL did not have this kind of effect on the company last year. Um, obviously, there was the Matt Hardy. I don't think that was last year. It was the year before, though, around that time that kind of kept them afloat a little bit. The uh, I'm at a loss, man. I, I don't know why they're so low, and I think we're making a lot of excuses but they're really low now, and I don't know why. This is this is honestly the best wrestling uh, program I've seen in years. What they're doing right now, there was so much buzz after Slammiversary. I I don't get it, dude. You you got anything? Uh, I know you Adam talk about this a little bit, but you know, are you as flabbergasted as me, or do you do you think you know what's going on? Well, seeing them going up, I mean, I know, you know, you think about a couple months ago where 
they were uh, flirting with at least the 300K. And I had always thought if they can average around that, then that's a good number. You know, yeah, I mean, you can guess and wonder. I mean, you know, I've always been a mindset when you're talking about football and any type of sports, that's always going to take precedence over, you know, impact. But I think at the end of the day, truthfully, honestly speaking, the thing with it being already uh, previously taped, it's watched at its own convenience, I like to believe. So, you know, we all know, depending what time, you know, impact comes on for us, you know, wherever locale we're in, you know, like say for me, for example, I'm not usually home. I'm doing something at the time that it airs my time, which is 8 p.m. East, uh, Pacific time. So I have to watch it at 10 on the DVR. So me watching on the DVR doesn't count towards the viewership that they're um, cal- calculating. So then, you know, like say you you might get off work late and you're watching it uh, uh, via stream. Okay. That's not going towards that. So I think the positive that I try to look at it as is, it's not that the stuff isn't being watched. I mean, you see a lot of, you know, whether it's the interactions that they have on their social media where you're seeing more positivity and not as many trolls. Like, I think it's being watched. It's just not being watched when it's initially aired. And it might not be being watched on the actual broadcast. It might be via stream or some other form, uh, uh, some other platform. So I think with that, you know, when they're factoring ratings, that's not being factored in. They're only factoring who's watching when it initially airs. That's just my guess, though. Yeah, and I totally see it. You know, we, th- this is discussed quite a bit where where content is just consumed differently these days. And, and um, I have not watched, I would say out of the last four episodes, I only watched one as it aired. You know, so there's been situations where I'm at work or, uh, I mean, God, this last week for Redefined, I was home. But I had so much shit to do around the house because I had been working so much and I just had this little window to, to clean and to do some other shit. Well, I didn't get to watch the show. So uh, fortunately, uh, I had a slow day at work um, a couple days later and I watched it on my phone. But uh, people people consume it differently. But I don't know for it to be just so the, the live viewership to be so low just out of nowhere just is is crazy to me. Um, there's, you know, people keep saying, well, they got to get off pop TV. You ain't getting off pop TV with 220,000 viewers. Not, <laughs> and happening. it's not even pop TV. It's not even, and everyone wants to go for pop TV. I look at it. You think about when the ratings were good on pop TV, you know, that nobody was coming for them then. And I get it. You know, obviously you can argue, well, a lot of people don't have it. I'm just a firm believer with having the option if you gave people the option where like hey you can only catch it this time and there was no dvr there was no streaming service i think the numbers would be a little bit better but i think knowing now where it's like just say thursday you might want to go go out you know date night chill with friends whatever and you know impact comes on at a certain time it's like well i don't have to get home to go see it i can just record it Worst case scenario, I'll watch it the next day. I have nothing going on. So it's being watched, but it's just not being watched when it's being uh, initially airing. So I just think there's so many different, you know, platforms to watch. And we've even discussed, like, and I think you had talked about how on YouTube, they pretty much give the whole show out on YouTube. So, you know, once again, that's another thing. So, and that's just where we're at overall for a lot of these uh, TV shows, like they're, you know, with the Hulus and the Netflix, where things that initially air, you don't have to catch it like how it used to be, you know, back when, you know, we were kids where you had to, if you didn't see it right then and there, you know, you'd have to wait a month for the rerun. Like there's different uh, avenues as far as watching impact. Uh, I have this, some um, software I use for social media marketing and I um, looked up impacts YouTube channel. They make on average $133,000 a month on YouTube. Um, which is basically 1.3 million for the year. So I can, I can kind of see where you, they probably make more off YouTube, honestly, um, than they do, do, uh, on, on pop TV. And it's kind of like, well, you know, if they keep putting up good content on YouTube and stuff that people want to click on and, and honestly their engagement numbers for their number of subscribers is actually real shitty. Um, but Overall, I mean, they're they're making money, and I, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of a a wrestling company. You know, they're always talking about Impact not not you know having income and everything like shit, like a hundred thousand dollars a month. Like, how how are you not uh, comfortably um, 
paying your wrestlers every month. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Um but yeah, that but that's a that's what I saw in my software, so and it's an estimated number, but you know, usually fairly accurate, so uh, that is going to do it for us. Do you got anything else? Um, we talked about the ratings a little bit. We ran over the show. Do you got anything else that uh, you want to say? No, it was just with the show. I mean, it was fine. I just think what I was looking forward to, it didn't, I don't want to say it let me down, but it didn't meet my expectations. But hey, I mean, we got next week. Um, I don't have the card in front of me, but I'm sure they're going to, the Impact Social Media will tweet out some of these matches and it's going to have me looking forward to Impact this week. I just know that next week they have Tessa versus Sue Young and then uh, the rematch of Petey Williams and Rich Swan. Um, I think they're going to build the, the show more so around uh, Moose and and whatever, you know, why he did what he did. So I just I just hope um, they 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 go a good direction with this. This has the potential, this trio to be r- really cool, um, a really big deal. Uh, a reason to really watch the show. So I, I'm really curious. I I mean, he, he pulled a Kevin Durant, basically. You know? <laughs> so, we'll, you know, we'll see. Can't beat him, join him. But obviously he has an issue with Eddie. The last thing I want to say, I wish I would have said this in the opening. Watching, watching the episode back after I already knew it happened, they actually did telegraph the shit out of it. Um You've never heard Moose pre- prior to this be like, oh, Eddie Edwards, my best friend. Like, this shit is out of nowhere. No. <laughs> True. I had said about a few months ago, I- I'm just good at picking up on things like this, man. Um, I said I think there's going to be some kind of program with Moose and Eddie in the future. And I based it off when Moose lost the briefcase. And um, Eli Drake said, oh, well, you know, why don't you come win his tag team titles? You can team up with, you know, Eddie Edwards or something like that. He's like, yeah, you know. I would love to win the title with Eddie Edwards, but that it, it just seemed like Eddie was so inadvertently just kind of thrown in there, just sneakily thrown in there. I, I just felt like, okay, there's something's going on with these two here pretty soon. So I also want to say about Eddie Edwards, I'm glad he lost the faux hawk finally and just is like combing a hair. That helps a lot. Like my fucking son wants a, I mean, I, I, about a year ago and he was like eight, even with seven, he wanted a faux hawk. It's like, you're not putting your hair like that, dude. You know, so for a grown ass man to be doing it and doing that like crazy gimmick, like it wasn't working for me. So I'm glad that he uh, kind of fixed that, but that'll do it for us this week. Thanks for listening, folks. Make sure to hit subscribe. If uh, you're on YouTube, give a thumbs up, whatever the case is. And uh, Adam will should be back in the saddle next week with Ro. And we will talk to you guys later. Peace. Hey, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Check out the video below for more Impact Wrestling related content. This is the Impact Lounge.